Hi, everyone, and thank you to those who joined early and bared with my over enthusiastic intro. Before we start, yes, the music has stopped. And while I really enjoyed that, I think it's good um, to not have it on while we um, participate in this really important forum and conversation. Um, my name is Arthi Kohli. I am a native New Yorker and the proud child of Indian immigrants. Um, I'm also a public servant um, in my professional life, but I'm here today in my personal capacity to help moderate this very important conversation um, for Council District 32. Um, and as many of you I'm sure are aware, the district, it spans from Ozen Park to Richmond Hill to the Rockaways and serves New York City's South Asian and Indo-Caribbean community, one of New York, New York City's fastest growing immigrant populations and one that is often marginalized, underserved, and disengaged from the political process. The district is composed of constituents who are too often disconnected. And today we really wanna ensure that we have a conversation and continue to engage New Yorkers who are living in those neighborhoods. Um, this event is hosted by Chaya CDC um, in partnership with APA Voice, Min Kwan, Caribbean Equality Project, South Asian Council for Social Services, Arab American Family Support Center and Common Cause. And Chaya CDC, if you're not aware, is a community-based organization in Queens that serves the South Asian and Indo-Caribbean community in New York City. Chaya, in addition to all of the orgs that are co-sponsoring today, has participated in a lot of get out the vote efforts, such as registering voters um, in New York City and engaging with New Yorkers through phone banking, door knocking before elections, participatory budgeting, and organizing candidate forums like we're doing today. Um, in addition, um, we're really proud to sponsor with all these organizations and just wanna reiterate that there is a huge emphasis in ensuring that New Yorkers that are historically not engaged in the political process have access to these important resources and participate in local elections because of the impact they have and how our city functions. Today, I wanna welcome the candidate who has joined our event and also remind folks, um, and something that I have to remind myself as well, that there is live interpretation. I have a tendency to talk quickly, so I'm going to try and slow it down a bit. Um, if you look on the bottom of your computer, there will be a globe, which is the interpretation button, and you'll actually be able to have access to interpretation in either Hindi or Spanish, if you would like to access um, that resource. Additionally, um, before we begin, um, also want to remind folks that if you're not tuning in via the webinar, you can also watch this event on Facebook um, at Chaya's, uh, on Chaya's page, we can drop the link um, in case folks want to share it out with their networks. And um, lastly, just want to reiterate um, before kind of going through the brief run of show we're going to be having tonight that this is um, a nonpartisan event. We invited all three candidates that will be participating in this Council District 32 election. Um, one of the candidates um, confirmed participation and is here with us tonight, and we're really grateful for that. And again, we want to ensure that everyone who's attending and all New Yorkers who are participating in this election have access to resources on all three candidates that are running and we'll provide that information in the chat as well as in follow up. Um, and so just really wanted to clearly state that um, before we begin, we'll be asking um, the candidate who is joining us to introduce themselves. Um, and we will also be going into a more structured Q&A, then we'll do a short lightning round, and then we'll open up, um, should time permit, to questions in the audience. Um, so we have a packed night um, planned for today. So I think with that, would love um, to just quickly pause, because again, have a tendency to speak quickly, and there is interpretation um, to ensure that any resources that we need um, to provide are pasted in the chat and also ensure that I'm giving time for interpretation. Okay, with that, um, if candidate Singh could um, please introduce themselves, um, let us know a little bit about yourself before we kind of start on um, the structured Q&A. And again, just a reminder to please 
be mindful of interpretation um, so that there's time for those folks to interpret what we're saying. And uh, is there a time limit to the introduction so far? Yes, we would, you know, appreciate if you could keep it to two minutes, um, but, you know, we'll also be watching the clock and we'll give you signals if needed. Okay, great. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to Chaya CDC and our coalition of partners who have hosted this uh, forum. This is really great for our community to be so civically engaged in knowing who to vote for and who's running and what they're standing for. So thank you so much. I'm Felicia Singh. I am a teacher, daughter of working class immigrants and workers' rights advocate. And it's an honor to be the Democratic nominee for the 32nd City Council District. I grew up and still live in this district I have for my entire life. My father is a taxi driver and my mom is a school bus matron. And I share that because I understand deeply the working class experience. I know what it's life like to live paycheck to paycheck with mounting debt and unstable employment. And it's about time we center our most working class communities in City Hall in a way that brings equity and justice to our communities. My priorities are to give us all an improved quality of life from college and career services to our students, to supporting our small businesses, to quality of life um, issues like trees being trimmed on time, making sure our potholes are filled um, and making sure we, are, we have pedestrian safety throughout the entire district. Uh, and even more importantly, we are a coastal district that's going to be heavily impacted by high rising sea levels and extreme flash flooding. So we need a climate resilience plan that works for all of our communities. I am so proud to have built a coalition of endorsements from assembly members like Khalil Anderson and Catalina Cruz who supported this campaign to Senator Chuck Schumer and Kristen, Kirsten Gillibrand. Um, to district leader Richard David and uh, Mufazal Hussein, all who support this campaign. I'm the labor strong candidate and the labor candidate in this race. And that means that our most working class essential workers from teachers to nurses, um, to janitors support our campaign and, and the, the plans that we stand for. I look forward to sharing more in this, in this uh, intimate evening of questions for just me, but um, I look forward to sharing more of our story and this, the plans that we hope to center in City Hall. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Candidate Singh, and um, very grateful to have you today. And we're gonna just really jump in. And the first question is immigration status, racism, cost of healthcare, working multiple jobs, language barriers, and the ongoing pandemic are all barriers to health care that our communities face. Asian American New Yorkers have higher health disparities in cancer and chronic diseases, such as heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, and mental health. And one in seven Asian American immigrant New Yorkers are undocumented. In your role in the city council, how would you reduce barriers to health care? So that is a very, you know, in-depth question. Um, if you could provide an answer within two minutes, um, that would be great. And um, since we just have one candidate present today, candidate Singh, um, please answer when you're ready. So what I really wanna center here is how we look at the whole person. I think when we build policy and we, when we build legislation, we need to think about the intersectional issues that people face. And in fact, I think your question really eloquently uh, summarizes the issues it means to be an immigrant, someone who's a who's working class, someone who might be undocumented, someone who might be a single mother. Healthcare needs to be so much more than just our bodies itself, our physical selves. Uh, we need mental health care access. We need access for for expectant mothers that are going to reduce the black maternal mortality here we have in the city, which is extremely high. Uh, that means expanding our access to doulas, midwives, lack lactation specialists. You know, here in District 32, especially on the Rockaway Peninsula, we have one hospital, St. John's, and it's been 
at, at capacity, especially in the middle of the pandemic and just recently overcame a fire on the roof. You know, we have limited resources here so, so gravely that it's impacting the health and wellness of our community members. So when I look at healthcare and expanding healthcare, one of the things that I've committed to is the dignity, community and power. It's the 2021 uh, New York City's immigrant, immigrant Communities Plan, which was created by organizations like Make the Road and other coalitions. And a part of that was making sure we have sustainable funding for our community-based organizations, making sure that we have um, municipal funding for our community health centers, increasing funding for emergency funds. Um, emergency funds could be emergency funds for folks who are uh, victims of domestic violence. They can be folks who are experiencing a mental health crisis. We need to make sure we're, we're increasing funds for emergency food assistance programs, expanding what healthcare looks like and access to healthcare here as well, and making sure we have more locations, not just on the peninsula, but throughout the entire South region of Queens, for specialists as well. We shouldn't be have, having to travel very far to go see a specialist um, and one that could be ra racking up so many bills. So when we look at our health and um, hospitals budget, we need to make sure we're, we're funding it equitably and fully and making sure that funding goes right here to South Queens. Thank you so much. And before I ask the second question, just wanna remind folks that if they wanna have access to interpretation, there's a globe at the bottom of their screen and they can access um, interpretation in Hindi and Spanish. And also just wanna remind folks, cause I see some comments in the chat, um, all three candidates were invited to this forum, um, but only one conversation. So um, I think there's an echo. Um, so I wanna reiterate that. And um, now we'll go on to the second question, which really, um, intertwines with the first question that was asked, um, really wanting to understand since District 32 was one of the districts that was hit most by COVID-19, specifically with positive rates in New York City, um, businesses in New York City now are requiring proof of vaccination for entry as a part of Mayor de Blasio's key to New York City plan to mandate vaccines um, for most indoor activities. Um, given just the continuing challenges and how, you know, the city continues to grapple with COVID-19, how are how you are ensuring you that New Yorkers have accessibility to information, including um, in terms of language access and also in light of technology barriers and vaccine hesitation that really exists within the community? What is your plan to educate residents around COVID-19 and ensure that New Yorkers in council district 32 are getting vaccinated? Well, first, I we have to admit the, the and, and be honest that two of the top five highest COVID rates communities in our city is actually two of District 32. It's Howard Beach and Breezy Point. Um, and the history behind both of these communities is that we have a lot of unfortunate misconceptions of what it means to get vaccinated, uh, particularly through the fear mongering of Trump. Um, and these are beliefs that are still spread around within our community. We had a last month a rally to unmask our children. We know that the Delta variant uh, is one that our children can get, and that is dangerous and scary. And we need to do everything we can to protect not only our, ourselves, but our family members and our children. So one of the things that I actually did during the pandemic in 20, uh, early in 2021 and at the end of 2020 was I worked at Redfern NYCHA um, in Far Rockaway, which is not in my district. But what we really did see was high cases of COVID, but low outreach to communities at the Redford NYCHA complex. And what we learned from that experience working with Black Health is that the most important way we can reach out to our communities and teach people is by being right there on the ground, providing that service. So we had a testing van on site and we were giving out masks and teaching people about why it was important to get tested, why getting tested consistently was necessary to reduce COVID rates 
and try to demystify any of the stereotypes or the notions that come with testing and COVID overall. And what we saw over a long consistent period of time was that community members began to trust us as, as people who were advocating on their behalf and advocating for their health and started to get tested consistently. We need to be doing the same things in communities where, the fir where vaccination is low, but COVID rates are higher. Um, and we need to make sure we're protecting our workers in those space, absolutely. But visibility, teaching, and meeting people where they are is a great place to start. And that's what I hope to do here in District 32 to increase vaccination rates. Thank you so much um, for that really robust answer. Before I begin, just want to flag that we're facing some tech challenges with interpretation. Okay. Sure. So if anyone who's watching needs interpretation, if you can just flag that in the chat, we'll try to work with you one-on-one -on -one to ensure that this is resolved. Um, so before we begin or continue rather, I wanted to just flag that. Um, additionally, I know that there have been some helpful links that have been dropped in the chat, um, such as the vote.nyc um, link where you can find your poll site. But just to go back to what you were talking about, um, Candidate Singh, wanted to get your thoughts on how we can ensure that New Yorkers um, in, your, in this district, District 32, continue to be civically engaged. I think a challenge sometimes is a lot of these meetings where a lot of this information is shared is at City Hall, which is in, in downtown Manhattan. So what do you believe should be done to just make it easier and to ensure that, you know, New Yorkers in the district still have access to that information and can participate in what is happening at City Hall? One thing we learned about remote working as much as uh, folks are really tired of Zooms is that it allows for access to spaces where it's hard to get to or you might not otherwise have been invited to the space. I think Zoom has really allowed people to testify from their home at public hearings at City Hall and we should actually continue that even if the city fully opens up and we're allowed to have and hearings are still being are, are actually being conducted in person but for folks who can't make it being able to do that uh, on Zoom is really important. The thing that we're lacking is you have to sometimes request for translation services. I think that that's something we need to talk about more often in City Hall, that if we want our communities to be civically engaged, we have to center language first all the time and then outreach in language as well. That's where a large disconnect happens where we offer the language translation, but people don't have the, the invitation in language or aren't outreached in language. So that's an issue that we need to close that gap in regards to civic engagement when it comes to um, participating in city council hearings or in city council in general. The other thing I wanna be able to do is actually bring city council to our community in district 32. I want our office to be a space where folks feel like they can come no matter what language they speak or however they identify and find a safe space uh, with our staff and with me to be able to share their concerns and we we built plans together it's how in fact I actually built all of our plans on our website which is in Spanish and in Bangla and in English with community members who live here uh, based on the concerns that are important to them that's what we want to continue to do in City Hall. Thank you so much for um, touching on that. And I think, again, this next question really links to it. And while I think there are a lot of resources that thankfully are provided online, um, Southeast Queens sometimes is considered a transportation desert. And as a member of city council, how would you address the lack of transportation that sometimes residents might face in the district? And what forms of transportation should the city prioritize to really address this challenge? That's a great question. And I and one of the biggest issues we've had here in this district is number one, accessibility. So we do have the A train, we have the J train, we have the ferry. We have a great local bus system on the northern side, the mainland of the district, but not so much on the peninsula. And we have some but limited express service. So we've got a mixture of things. The, the, one of the largest gaps that we have though is we have 14 train station hubs and only two of them are accessible by train station. The first is in Howard Beach and the second is on the Rockaway Peninsula. 
we need more accessibility for our elderly, pregnant families um, and our disabled to go up and down uh, the train station to get to work or wherever they need to be going. That's number one. The second is we're seeing a loss, and this has to do with accessibility too, of benches where there are bus stops as well. Um, and a lot of that proponent was to deter our unhoused population from sleeping and resting on these bus uh, at these bus stops. But it also prevented people who needed a seat while they waited for the bus to come to rest as well. Uh, we need to bring that back. The third is really looking at the transportation infrastructure we have already and invest in a more express service so people on the peninsula can get throughout the borough um, easily and faster, as well as people here on the mainland like Ozone Park and South Richmond Hill and Woodhaven can get to work in a faster on a faster route. Our, SBS, our, our bus lanes really do help with that, but when cars block the bus lanes, um, it's really difficult and inhibits transportation. So we need to have either larger signs that indicate when cars can and cannot park there. That would be helpful. Um, outside of that, our ferry has been a huge proponent on helping people get to and from uh, the city or Manhattan from the peninsula of Queensboro. We need to either increase uh, the ferry service to make sure it includes another stop. Um, and also pot potentially have another line so that people who go um, who are not here on the peninsula or in Queens to tour can get to and from the ferry faster. So those are multiple ways. The other long term uh, way that people are talking about in regards to improving transportation here in the district is something called the Queens Link. That is a high line kind of like a park where you can walk through to get to one neighborhood to the next and reestablishing the Long Island Railroad here on the peninsula going through Howard Beach and up to Ozone Park. That is estimated at different prices, 3 billion, some say 8 billion. Um, that's also dependent on federal funding and funding that's going to be matched by MTA. The other proponent of this is that it will take significant amount of time to have this service uh, ready for us, probably anywhere between seven to 10 years, but it is something we should look into investing to improve transportation here in the South of Queens. Great, and I think, um just to touch base on something you mentioned um, about New Yorkers that are unhoused, um, you know, historically, um, you know, I think it's very well known that New York City has a homeless crisis. And historically and disproportionately, this affects our LGBTQ youth. Um, they comprise up to 40% of the homeless youth population. So want to hear more from you on what your plans are to tackle this issue specifically in regards to LGBTQ um, Q youth um, and how you're planning to support these youth, um, you know, as students in their schools. Before I also just um, pass the mic to you, Candidate Singh, want to remind folks that if they have any questions, we're tracking it in the chat and we wanna ensure that we get to them later on in the evening. So please continue to post those and we'll, be, um, we'll ensure that we actually address them later on in the evening. So as a teacher, this really is such an important question because here in District 32, we actually have uh, about 1,000 to 2,000 children who are unhoused in this district. And the way that we treat in particular our LGBTQ youth right now, whether it's in our schools or folks just walking around our communities is one for so many that is very isolated um, and scary. And one of the biggest things we can do in schools, number one, is making sure that we have organizations, nonprofits, our schools are equipped, our staff, our teachers, our principals are equipped with the language and the curricula to make sure we are well informed um, people who are making it a safe space for our students who are LGBTQ. Um, and that's really making sure we're teaching curriculum that's anti-racist and culturally responsive. That's making sure that our LGBTQ youth have social workers and guidance counselors that they feel safe with. Um, and making sure we have enough guidance counselors and social workers within our schools. It's making sure that our LGBTQ youth are also not policed. Um, a lot of the times, 
uh, upon entering school, some schools you have a metal detector that you have to go through or a school safety agent that you have to interact with first. Whereas other students who go to other schools, their first person that's being greeted uh, by is their principal or their teacher or a friendly face. Uh, that needs to be equitable across our city and especially across here in District 32. The other issue too that we're having is a lot of our community members have never felt truly safe within our, our district because of a lot of conservative views that have allowed them to feel like they need to hide or isolate themselves. And really it's making sure we have organizations here in this district that work closely with our LGBTQ population and our youth. We do have some on the peninsula, but we need so much more and we need many more here on the mainland um, that focuses on language first because we have community members who speak Bangla, who speak Spanish, um, that need that access to services as well. Thank you so much for answering that. And there actually was a note of gratitude from someone who helped frame that question. I think that oftentimes, personally, I've seen, you know, sometimes talking about LGBTQ plus issues can be viewed as taboo in the South Asian community. So I think it's really important to have a space where we can address those questions and ensure that New Yorkers that might be experiencing some of those challenges know what resources they have access to. So thank you so much and just wanted to shout out that note of gratitude. Um, additionally, another population that is disproportionately impacted by the homelessness crisis it are folks who experience mental illness. Um, a 29 mental health crisis. He called over 180,000 911 mental health crisis calls in the last 10 years. How would you support a community centered response to mental health crisis calls? Do you support the creation of an agency that is separate from the NYPD to be responsible solution Similar to how we treat public safety in New York City, the word, the ironic part about public safety is that the public hasn't really ever had a chance to name and decide. <laughs> the best interests of all of our community members. And that's especially true to folks who are facing a mental health crisis. What I commend is a pilot program called Be Heard. Now, Be Heard. Pilot program We Heard. Respond and help prevent crises to someone who's going through a mental health crisis. You still have to call 911, but what the dispatcher does is link the caller or link the person who's going through this specific crisis with a social worker, with a mental health professional and an EMT or EMS worker that comes in response. Um, and what, what folks saw was a reduction of hospitalizations by 50%. Now what's really important about that and reducing uh, folks who are going to a mental health crisis to go to a hospital is that one, as we talked about healthcare is not affordable for everyone. Um, and two, you're putting them in an isolated space where we don't know what care could look like and then they're being released back out into society without any further care or follow-up and we don't want that to happen what's been really amazing about this pilot program is it's also honest you know in the beginning when this idea was initiated there were folks who are ems workers or emt workers who were nervous about the idea of violence escalating in these situations but after proper training um, and de-escalation training specifically what they saw was only having to call the police for, for anything that escalated seven times during this entire pilot program. These are the types of services that I want to make sure we have access to, to here in South Queens, in District 32, and in our neighboring city council districts, because we benefit from other forms of care outside of just law enforcement, who is not equipped to provide resources or help or care for, for folks who are in mental health crisis. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, before I move on to the remaining questions, before we go to a rapid round, just want to remind folks again that if they want to gain more information, um, such as finding their poll site, they can go to vote.nyc. 
In addition, we'll be posting other resources and links that you और पूल साइट में जाकर आप वोटिंग के बारे में ज्यादा जानकारी ले सकते हैं ये लिंक जो है चैट बॉक्स में भी रखा है वो दिख सकते हैं और वोट एन वाई सी में जाके आप लिंक क्लिक करके वो दिख सकते हैं leaving these links is super critical um and of, of course we're we're just beginning this conversation we'll continue to um share those reminders um throughout the event um so as you mentioned um you know there are many there are resources you're proposing you would provide to new yorkers that are disproportionately faced um by the homeless crisis but additionally um as we know many immigrant communities having access to home ownership is one way that we can ensure that there's more housing security um, and also to ensure that there's a means for generational wealth. However, we know that there are many barriers for first time home buyers with New York City's current market rates and as they continue to rise. The COVID Act okay. bill introduced by. So, immigrant with a home buyer, new job, with a male, in whom I can make a good problem by. But the grant guidelines around the purchase price is at a level that does not make sense for the New York City market. What are your thoughts about this bill and how will you preserve and promote? home ownership in New York City and in Council District 32. Have a harder time with home ownership than any other type of community in New York City, especially here in Queens, where in South Queens, we actually have really high rates of tax lien sales on homes. And these tax lien sales are placed on homes uh, based on your inability to pay your property tax and or pay your utilities. So these are other preventative measures from home ownership that need to be examined as well in conjunction with Senator Salazar's bill. I mean, this is a state level and city level coalition that needs to happen to provide home ownership that is feasible for new homeowners and feasible for people who are currently homeowners. Uh, if, if there's anyone who understands the difficulty of owning a home and maintaining a home, it's me. My family was almost evicted from our home in the middle of the pandemic um, by the United States Bankruptcy Court. There are so many barriers to home ownership that we face. Abolishing the tax lien uh, helps. Senator Salazar's bill does help, but we want to make sure that the purchase price level makes sense for the New York City market. Um, and how we do that is how we determine price level and property tax throughout our dish, our city. Um, property taxes are uh, restoring and reforming what property tax looks like at the, at the city council level uh, is not very much pop, uh, something that we're able to do. We can change the formula for how we determine property tax, but all of that is at the state level and mayoral control. And these are the things we need to be pushing for is how we allow access to grants to loans to provide home ownership. The other thing too that we need to think about is people have a hard time maintaining their current homes. So abolishing the tax lien works, uh, making sure that our elder community also have access to remaining in their homes, because the hardest part about owning a home as an elder is that it's difficult to create your home to be accessible. So if you have a wheelchair or you need a ramp, uh, some sort of ramp or you need uh, accommodations inside your house, that's what actually puts people to move into uh, private nursing homes or um, other types of, of housing because you can't afford to then maintain your home ownership and also make it accessible. So we need to find other pathways to home ownership that don't 
make us all go into debt. That's the number one thing we need to focus on is that because homeowners are going into debt, it's increasing predatory lending across our city and we can't have that happen either. So this is a multi-layered solution, looking at Senator Salazar's bill and making sure it works for everyone, particularly homes here in South Queens where we have high, higher than average tax lien sales on homes and making sure our elders can still maintain homes and, and creating a market for young people to also purchase their first home. And just continuing on the conversation around affordable housing, um, there are a significant percentage of basement apartments in District 32. Um, rent from basement apartments are sometimes one of the few ways homeowners are able to afford and make their mortgage payments and are also an affordable option for many renters. Do you support basement legalization? Why or why not? And if yes, what steps are you willing to take to ensure basement legalization? I actually was one of the candidates who during the primary went to Chaya CDC's uh, session teaching us about the basement program. And it was something that I have on my website that I've adapted because we need to make sure that basements are legalized. People are going to live in basements, whether they're legal or illegal. And what we need to do is, per, is, is in legalizing them, protect homeowners and expand affordable housing for everyone else who can live in a basement and do that safely. You know, we saw tragic things happen during Hurricane Ida, like basement flooding um, and the loss of lives for people who live in basements. And were those basements legal? Probably not. So not only are people at risk living in basements currently, but so are homeowners who rent their basements illegally. So the best way to do this as per Chia CDC's plan is to make sure we're, we're um, updating the zoning codes, we are providing financial assistance and advisory to homeowners, small landlords, landlords who want to convert their basements. And that's something I would support in City Hall and pushing to legalize. Great, thank you so much for um, sharing that with us. And um, again, just putting links in the chat, we're linking to your website, um, Candidate Singh, and to the other candidates. Um, and also um, we'll ensure that we um, link to some of the resources you mentioned, such as um, Chaya's website. Um, before we begin the lightning round, I um, want to ensure that we hit on this really important question. Um, City Council District 32 um, has a lot has all you know for a long time been a very diverse district, but sometimes the political representation has not always reflected that diversity. How will you ensure that your office reflects the political, racial, and cultural diversity of District 32? Well, first, we are already doing that, just that on our campaign. We have language translated in six languages to make sure our community members have access to our policy, our plans, who I am, and what I'm hoping to do once in City Hall. That's, that step in itself is really important because in order to expand the electorate, you need to make sure people are engaged. They can't be engaged if they don't have language access. So I'm really proud to have a team, to have built a team that, that assists with language translation, but also, and more importantly, um, or equally importantly, rather, relationally organizes in language. It's been such a really beautiful experience to see community members who live in our district communicate with their neighbors in language, share information about this race and how urgent it is that we need to vote, registers people to vote, helps them access what it looks like to look at our plans and build those plans with us. That's the same thing I wanna be able to translate into our office once in City Hall, It's making sure we have staff that also speaks different languages that understands um, culturally appropriate uh, behaviors and customs of the different cultures that we would represent um, and identities that we represent. And then ensuring that we have translations continued throughout our entire cycle uh, once elected. That's really important to me. That's been important in this race as a candidate and that will continue to be just as important as an elected official. Thank you so much. Um, and before we begin the lightning round, first just want to reiterate, because I'm seeing some comments in the chat, that we did invite um, every candidate. 
Um, Felicia um, Singh was the only candidate to attend. And again, very grateful for your participation this evening. Um, also, before I kind of walk through um, the rules of the lightning round, want to take a moment again to express gratitude and thanks to Chaya CDC, who's hosting this event in partnership with APA Voice, Min Kwan, Caribbean Equality Project, South Asian Council for Social Services, Arab American Family Support Center, and Common Cause. And again, we are dropping relevant links um, that are being mentioned during this conversation in the chat. Um, now, before we begin the lightning round, um, just wanna um, let you know, candidates Singh, that we'll be giving you about a minute to answer each question. We're really trying to get you know, rapid response answers and, and get through these um, within that time period so that we can open it up to audience questions. So with that being said, the first question is, did you receive any contributions from the real estate industry? Why or why not? I did not receive any or will not, have not asked for anyone to donate contributions from the real estate industry itself. Uh, I know that the best kind of development is one led by the community and by investing in real estate, allowing real estate to invest on our campaign. It means that we would have developers really owning and saying how public land is used in this district and we don't want that. It's important to note that my opponent, Joanne Ariola, is receiving funding from billionaire Stephen Ross, who is a real estate mogul and is funding this campaign and, and will be spending $300,000 smearing my name. Okay, and before we go on to the next question, just want to remind folks that if they have questions, please post it in the chat. Um, we want to ensure that we get to those. Um, I also want to quickly flag that um, the Facebook Live for whatever reason isn't posting. So we'll post this conversation after the, after the event on Facebook. So the next question is, what percentage of your donations came from residents within District 32? I don't have the percent, but I know I have the amount of donors, which is 154. Um, wonderful donors have been able to uh, donate to our campaign. Great. Thank you. Um, and if you're elected, what is one pending legislation in city council you would advocate for on your first day? And so why? <laughs> this isn't pending legislation, but today, uh, taxi drivers, allies, and their families have begun a hunger strike for debt relief because the mayor has selected a plan that actually is not going to give us any relief. And as a daughter of a taxi driver, this is a large priority because folks who are working class who serve our city uh, but ex have extreme debt need relief now. Um, and what we don't want to see is the mayor shovel this, uh, push this off to the next and new administration. If that time does come to do that, we need to do everything we can to ensure that we have a budget that's going to provide debt relief for taxi drivers. So that's something I would push not only right now, but also once in City Hall. Um, and the next question is really relevant to the time of year. Um, if elected, would you champion legislation to add the volley to the Department of Education school calendar? Absolutely. It's about time. And it's quickly approaching. <laughs> so um, feels really relevant right now. Um, which roads would you prioritize for repaving in your first year in office and why? So we have roads here, Liberty Avenue from 88th Street to uh, 100th Street that need repaving. We have roads here on 106th Street and Liberty, um, and also Howard Beach, 196th uh, Avenue that need repaving, as well as many streets on the peninsula. So we have an issue across the entire part of the district, actually, when it comes to fixing our roads. One of the biggest priorities that if we were to repave or restructure because we need new drainage and sewage systems is to also bring the power lines down. Uh, because we're a coastal district, uh, we could lo we lose electricity often during, during storms, um, like Hurricane Ida, um, and bringing power lines down while also repaving roads and fixing our sewage system just is the smartest thing we can do. And if elected, which council committees would you want to serve on and why? Of course, Committee on Education as a teacher, I would love to serve there. Uh, committee on, on Sanitation as well as um, Environmental Protection and or um, Waterfront and Resiliency. 
Uh, why? Because all of those issues really impact our community right now. We have um, we have a garbage and trash issue in our district. We are a coastal district, so making sure we have an advocate talking about climate resilience in city council is really important. And of course, education is so near and dear to my heart and we wanna do everything we can to integrate our schools. And do you support participatory budgeting? And if so, why? Absolutely, I definitely do. It's something I've been already talking to our communities about. Participatory budgeting allows our community members to decide where our tax dollars go and where, where our community needs funding. And what's even better about this participatory budgeting is our community members can create projects and they are the deciding factor of where money can go. And it could be projects like maybe funding a school program or a community garden or doing murals throughout our entire district, whatever it might be big or small, we have the funding to do that and our community members vote on that said project. So I'm really excited about bringing participatory budgeting back to District 32. And before um, I end the rapid um, fire round and go into questions that have been brought up by the um, audience, just wanna remind folks that again, we have some time um, after this last question. So if you have any, please continue to post them in the chat. Um, and the last question of this um, rapid round um, question series, I guess, um, is do you support the intro of 1867, um, sometimes also known as Our City, Our Vote, which would extend voting rights to nearly 1 million permanent residents in New York City? And if so, why do you support this legislation? I absolutely support this legislation. I actually testified on behalf of the legislation just recently. It's so important that the folks who pay taxes in our community, who invest in our community, who live here, have access to voting. And in fact, this would be a reinstating of voting rights because folks who did have green cards or were permanent re residents at one point did were able to vote. Um, so this would be reinstating their vote. What's important to note is that my opponent does not support expanding voting rights. In fact, just uh, yesterday during a debate, we got the question about whether or not we wanted to support having an ID to vote. Uh, this is something I said no to. Uh, she wants to also push for this. So our voting, expanding our voting rights is at risk in this election as well. Thank you so much, Candidate Singh. That's the end of the rapid fire round. Now I'm going to ask some questions that our audience has come up with. Um, and the first question is from Muhammad from Caribbean Equality Project. Um, and they're asking, um, District 32 is home to a diverse and intersectional population, including a growing LGBTQ plus community. For many years, the current council member has not allocated any discretionary funding to organizations specifically serving queer and trans people, many of whom disproportionately experience higher rates of homelessness, police violence, lack of access to affirming health care, job discrimination, and inequities in affordable housing. If elected, how will you equitably distribute discretionary funding to invest in this marginalized, underserved, and under-resourced population? I really appreciate you uplifting this issue because it has been inequitable. The way funding has been distributed has been inequitable throughout our district. In looking at um, Eric Ulrich's discretionary funds from 20. 14 or 2012 to 2015, most of the discretionary funds have not actually gone to Ozone Park, South Richmond Hill and Woodhaven. Um, and that's a disservice to our community members. One of the things that I've committed to, um, and you'll see under community safety on my website agenda is how we expand the access to discretionary funds. From my learning experience, it sounds like a lot of community-based organizations, particularly ones that really um, take care of our most marginalized uh, members like our LGBTQ population, don't actually need assistance in applying for discretionary funds. Like day one, that's the issue is the paperwork. It's understanding the timeline for it and needing that assistance. I want our office or city council to be a place where uh, groups that treat uh, and take care of the wellness and the health of our our most marginalized community members get funding first or have access to how they can complete funding paperwork um, and then allocating that um, 
equitably is really important to me as a as a council member. So that's something I'm definitely committing to doing, particularly organizations that look at um, the health and wellness of our LGBTQ uh, population, survivors, especially survivors of um, domestic violence or gender based violence, uh, those who are organizations that cater to folks who have mental health crisis, among many other things. Great. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, the next question is, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Marlene. Um, and they're asking if you're elected, would you consider supporting the sickle cell bill that has been pending? I definitely want to read more about that bill. Um, and once I do, I would definitely get back to you. I, I personally don't know very much about the sickle cell bill. Um, but if it's what I'm assuming it is, which is expanding health care for those who are um, who are who have sickle cell anemia, absolutely. And um, I see another question. Um, thank you, Vishnu, for posting it again in the chat. I'm trying to track, um, and so is our team. But if we miss anything, please feel free to remind us. Um, the question is, um, how are you planning to address um, issues um, that are, you know, really impact seniors? Will you be providing more senior centers and food pantries specifically in Richmond Hill? You know, Yes, to making sure we're, we're expanding senior centers and a lot of that has to do with funding as well. Um, we host pantries because our city was negligent in investing in a, in a care economy and making sure people have a living wage, have a job, um, a sustainable job at that one and is able to put food on their table. So that is my priority. I think continuing pantries is a beautiful idea and I love it. And I also wanna make sure that we're investing in a care economy that includes job investment, that includes access to healthcare, that includes um, health, uh, health and wellness overall for our community members. Um, pantries are a great way to engage our community and making sure we're feeding our community, but our city government also needs to do that job. And just to follow up on that, because I realized that there are more sections to that question, is there anything specifically you're planning to do policy wise to address this issue? So um, in terms of elder care, one of the things that I hope to do um, is increase elders access to grants and or loans to help make their homes more accessible. That's number one. Number two is that currently there is a system within our city to freeze rent for our elder communities, but many people don't actually know that that exists and don't know how to apply for that type of care if they are renters, um, have a hard time paying rent. So your landlord, whether you live in a building or in a home and you're renting a second floor, uh, apartment in a house can't raise your rent because of this law or this bill, but you have to qualify and apply for that paperwork. Um, a lot of our elders don't know how to do that because they might not have access to a computer or someone to assist them with that paperwork. That's the type of service that I hope to do at, in our um, office. The other thing that we need to look at is making sure our city is not so, it, our city is very centered on being able-bodied and a lot of our elders have a hard time getting to and from bus stops or getting up and down the stairs for to access the train. And like I said, improving accessibility across the district is a priority of mine. And that would also be assist, helping elders get around our communities and our district. You beat me to it because my next question was really going to be focused on how you're providing resources to um, seniors that may um, need access or might have disabilities, um, but you just answered that. So I'm gonna move on to the next question, which is what can we do about safety on the streets? How can we ensure that the roads are clean and safe? So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this is a question focused on pedestrian safety um, with clean roads and, and, and safe streets. So this is multi-layered. I one of the city agencies that I know I want to work closely with is Department of Transportation because of the issues we've had with speeding um, in this community. One of our schools, one of our local schools, PS sixty three, doesn't have a speed bump right in front of it, and there's a lot of speeding that happen happens at the same time that children are crossing the streets, whether going to school or coming out of school, and that's dangerous for everyone. Um, I'm a proponent of Vision Zero. And 
And I know it's really frustrating to be the one to get a ticket if you're just driving a little bit above the speed limit. But what it does is protects our community members who are um, at risk during speeding, which happens rapidly throughout this district. The other way we want to protect pedestrians um, is also through protected bike lanes as well. You know, not everyone drives. Some people take their bikes around the community and we have bike lanes sketched um, drawn throughout the community in certain areas protecting them fully is one of our one of my biggest priorities as well. I think there are a lot of parts of our district that need stop signs or speed bumps or stop lights. Um, and really, it's about DOT coming down here doing an assessment and really working with their council member, which will be hopefully me to advocate for more pedestrian safety here in South Queens. And the next question actually transitions beautifully from pedestrian safety to public safety. Um, it's a question I've seen a few times in the chat. I think someone named Michael asked it as well, but what are you doing to ensure that um, the district is safe from um, a public safety perspective? Um, mm -hmm. And what are you doing to combat the increase in crime? So this is, um, this is a really important question. And one of the things that I want us to really think about is number one, the way we view public safety and the way we view crime. Right now, there is one method in which we use to keep us safe, and that's through our NYPD, it's through law enforcement. Our law enforcement budget is a budget of anywhere between 5.8 or 5.4 to $6 billion a year. In the fiscal year of 2021 to 2022, our law enforcement budget is going to be 5.4 billion with an additional 200 million um, for other miscellaneous resources that law enforcement will need to keep us safe. And despite having a large budget like that, we still have an increase in crime. Why? Why is it that we put so much money into a law enforcement in keeping us safe, but we don't see a reduction in crime? It's because of the way that we see what qualifies us to keep, what qualifies to keep us safe. What I want to do as a council member is expand what public safety looks like for our community. And it's in a lot of the services I talked about earlier with uh, Be Heard being in District 32, Violence Interrupters, which is another pilot program in Brownsville. Uh, we, we, Brownsville, East New York, we share Pitkin Avenue. And violence interrupters saw, which are trained folks who are trained in de-escalation, our community members who work with a nonprofit that actually stand outside and help build relationships with neighbors. And they saw a reduction in gun violence within a week of just being present. Now imagine if we expand that throughout the district. Gun violence, issues of violence coming out of our trains is a real thing in this district. We've had a police car in every corner all the time to patrol, uh, to maintain some sort of intimidation and presence, and still we have crime. So when we expand what public safety looks like and we invest in community resources, we invest in job training, job access, invest in our economy by creating more jobs, what you're going to see is a reduction of crime because we might not be able to control why every single person uh, commits a crime, but a lot of the, the rationale behind what crimes are committed and who commits them is because we don't have anything else. It's because we don't have um, a care economy. And when we invest and really take a look at what it looks like to expand public safety in our district, what we're doing is care for people in a really revolutionary way than we ever have. You know, we see based on data that folks who, who call for mental health crisis, folks who call for domestic violence reports, those are the things that are on the rise right now coming out of a pandemic. But the same responses are not working. So we need to do something else and expanding public safety by reallocating our budget, our overall $100 billion budget in New York City to be something that's centered on investing in people is my number one priority. And I think the next question really ties into this thought of investing in people. Um, someone who's in the audience asked, what are your plans to make property taxes more equitable? Um, from their perspective, they said, we pay one of the highest property taxes in the city. Yeah, property taxes are extremely 
extremely high. I mean, you're talking to somebody whose family pays property tax as well. Um, and it's really hard to maintain your home right now if you're a homeowner. Uh, the first thing I wanna say is that the discretion of property tax is at the state level. We could sort of play around with the formula of how someone is divided and how, how we determine property tax. And that's something that's property tax reform. That is something I'm committed to doing in city hall and property tax, the, the law, the way we decide classes and the amount is actually a state level and mayoral control. Uh, we need to have more conversations with that. I would encourage you to also push the mayor to have more of a plan on property tax as well as state legislators who have more um, privy to what property tax looks like for us on the ground. But property tax reform at the city council level is something I would absolutely advocate for here. And the next question, um, is I'm just going to read it verbatim. Queens residents are charged a fee to move from mainland Queens to the Rockaway Peninsula. Though this issue resides with the state legislators, what would you as a candidate do to advance the removal of the toll from the Cross Bay Bridge if elected? I know this is something that Assembly Member uh, Pfeffer Amato has been has has actually sponsored and is pushing as much as she can at the state level. That's something I would join her in doing. It's really ridiculous that we have a fee from one part of our district to the other, whether you move there or you're traveling in and out. Um, that's the most that we can do at, this, at the city level is making sure we're pushing our state legislators to make this a priority because we are working class community members and every single dollar counts. And if we have to have a fee to go from one side of our district to another, that's just inequitable. It's literally unfair. I, I don't know why this toll exists, um, but I definitely wanna work with our assembly members in pushing this to be eliminated. Thank you so much. And um, before going on to the next few questions that we've gotten from the audience, just wanna do a quick reminder and plug that if you do have any questions um, that you would like us to address before we end for the evening, please ensure you post them in the chat. Additionally, we're gonna be linking to a lot of really important and helpful resources, such as links to the websites of all the candidates and a voter guide that has been created by some of the organizations that are co-sponsoring um, this event tonight. Um, additionally, if you need to find your poll site or any other information about voting, um, either voting early or on election day, you can do so at vote.nyc. And again, we'll post all of these resources um, in the chat to ensure that everyone um, has those links. Um, so the next question um, relates to what you were saying earlier in the evening, but what can we do to prevent gentrification, specifically policy-wise? Oof, that's a really good question. Many things. I think number one, it's protecting our small businesses. A lot of development happens in areas where folks feel like they could um, where businesses like mom and pop businesses here in this district get pushed out. Um, you know, Queens only received 17% of loans and grants during the pandemic. And what that told me and what I told small businesses here is that we didn't have an advocate in city hall that was going to say, okay, here is how you're gonna apply for those that, land, that loan or those grants. Here it is in the language that you prefer. Here's someone who can help you in your said language or your preferred language applying for that specific loan or grant. It was a lot of red tape. Um, and that's why only 17% of grants and loans came here to, to this borough. And I would imagine that less came to South Queens and more probably went to areas that um, are economically thriving like Astoria and have so many different uh, benefits to be in those parts of Queens rather than South Queens, which is a transportation desert and it's hard for folks to get here. So that's number one is really making sure our mom and pops, uh, the small businesses are thriving um, and have a reason to actually stay open and then second, we need to make sure that we're not prioritizing private development 
that's the hardest, that's the part that's, that needs to be priority. Our ULERP system, which is our system for how public land is used at the city council level, only allows for community boards and even our borough president to be advised, to provide advisory suggestions um, and not really solidified yes or no voting when it comes to development here. That's dangerous for our communities because that aids the gentrification of our, of our district um, and in South Queens. So uh we we have uh, like i said stephen ross is someone who's a billionaire real estate uh, mogul he invested in gateway plaza here in brooklyn and also in development in far rockaway we don't want to see that happen here where affordable units are less or you take longer to get an affordable unit um, affordable housing needs to be something that's really owned by not by by our community or nonprofits that are going to center um a center people to have permanent housing, number one, and then that doesn't rise up rent for our small businesses and keep mom and pops here, mom and pop businesses here. So any legislation that helps support that is something that we could be doing and, and formulating in city hall. And that's actually like changing the way our EULA process, process works and rewriting that. Luckily, there are a lot of city council candidates elect who are gonna be, um, who will who who won their primary and will automatically be in that seat center, uh, reaching changing ULERP, um, and that's something that I would support as well because that helps prevent gentrification in our neighborhoods. And another question that I think is on some people's mind is we've talked a lot about public safety. Would love to hear um, your stance on whether you believe in defunding the police or not, and and just really elaborate a little bit more on that. Sure. So what I said before about expanding public safety and reimagining what it could look like for our community, a lot of that has to do, as I said, with looking at our $100 billion budget and taking a look at how we spend, where we spend it, and why. A large portion of our funding goes to um, education, 30%. And about 7%, which is like one of the third highest allocation is actually in our law enforcement budget, where, where anywhere between 5.8 to 6 billion is allocated to our law enforcement. Um, I am an I am proposing that we at least reallocate $1 billion from law enforcement budget to other services like infrastructure for our communities like social services, like other methods to keeping us safe, be heard, violence interrupters, making sure we're catering to nonprofits who help provide safe, safety and transitional services to those who are survivors or, or um, folks who are experiencing gender-based violence. That's really important. So um, that is where I stand. I, I think here in our district, this has been one of the most contested or controversial topics because we've been so um, we've been so used to the traditional forms of law enforcement. And while that will still exist, you know, the word defund is an abolition are two different words that mean two different things. When we, we reallocate funds, it's moving funds to make sure that our budget is centered on people. Abolition is getting rid of something completely. I have not run a campaign on abolition. I've run a campaign on making sure that our budget is a reflection of our, of our morals and our values as a city and as people. That's what I hope to do in City Hall. Thank you so much for answering that question. Um, before I go to the last question of the evening and then um, provide you time for closing remarks, um, just wanna flag um, some other links that were in the chat. I think in addition, I just wanna clearly state, and I would be remiss if I didn't just given what I do in my day job, but in addition to candidates being on the ballot for several roles in city government, there are also five ballot proposals that will be on the ballot. and. You would be surprised many New Yorkers are still not aware about what these are and um, why they matter. Um, but I just want to flag that there's some really helpful resources that have been um, put in the chat and really want to reiterate that um, it's really crucial to be informed about what these proposals are um, and to really read up on them. A lot of New Yorkers were wondering why ranked choice voting was implemented in the June primary. That was actually a ballot proposal in 2019. So just again, reiterating that, um, and now I'm going to close with the last question we received in the chat from the audience. Um, 
it's a slightly longer question, so bear with me um, as I read it out loud. So for the past four years, our country experienced an unprecedented increase in hate violence against immigrants, LGBTQ plus people, Asian people, Black people, Hindus, and Muslims, including in District 32. These horrendous acts of hate were incited through racist, Islamophobic, and xenophobic language used, particularly by the former president of this country. If elected, name three plans of action you will enact to combat racism and anti-hate violence to improve public safety. Woo. <laughs> It's a great question. Um, so number one, combating racism is more than just acts of legislation. It has a lot to do with community buy-in and it has a lot to do with education. Um, I have on my website an idea for anti-racist curriculum. You know, as a teacher and someone who helped lead anti-racist and culturally responsive teaching in my last school, Coney Island Prep, what we did was we had professional development that was mandated for all of our staff, including our principals, and sometimes our um, genitorial staff would also participate in this anti-racist tra training. Anyone who interacts with children did. And what we saw over a span of time was we went from a zero tolerance policy to a restorative justice policy within our schools, simply for because of this pilot pro program of really centering culturally responsive teaching. Now, what's really unique about District 27 schools here in this 32nd City Council District is we actually do culturally responsive teaching, professional development for all staff. Now, what happens in the classroom during those times? What happens to follow up? What happens when there's an incident of racism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, an attack on our LGBTQ student is really dependent school by school. And sometimes that's dangerous because we don't know what, what kind of care is provided in those spaces. So in order to create more anti-racist spaces, there needs to be an overall commitment from people, from adults who shape spaces for our children, number one, because those are the people who are, are most harmed all the time and, and don't actually get the advocacy they need. And th that's our youth. That, and as a teacher, that's who I really think about when, you, when you're asking me this question. So thinking about our schools and making an anti-racist space, spaces is a commitment to culturally responsive teaching. Um, and then a commitment to follow up and continuous learning. It's a change in the way we teach. It's how we teach history and, and who gets to teach it. It's making sure we're retaining educators of color and they're being paid at the same rates as their white counterparts. Uh, that's really important. That's how we change and, and revolutionize how we teach. Now, when it comes to communities, that's a whole different ball game because the people, as we have in District 32, who lead power and the power dynamic and the decision making power are not reflective of the people who live in our communities. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I ran for office because of my participation in local civic association, block associations, community boards, where we love to throw around the diversity card, but diversity doesn't have power all the time. People do, who, who fill in all of those, that diversity card for their organization, for community-based organizations here in this district, like community boards and civic associations don't actually get a say in decision-making power. And a part of that has to do with our inability to effectively take their concerns seriously. Um, we do at the Queensboro president's um, level have someone who is a liaison to community boards to conflicts of racism, um, but that doesn't go far enough. And there's a lot of other issues with how we lead here in our communities. I think the second thing I wanna make sure I'm promoting as a council member are the, the, the need for um, people in our own community of all different identities to be able to lead within this district. And that looks like starting their own clubs. That looks like disrupting the status quo and being present as many times as we can and be as civically engaged as many times as we can. I think this race allowed to, and promoted a lot of that. Um, and then it's, it's also, 
you know, this district in particular has a voting block that is majority white and has owned a lot of our voting power. And a lot of the work should not be done by people of color to teach anti-racism to our white communities that have been inherently racist. It needs to be the job of, of our white community members, our white allies. Luckily for us um, on the peninsula, we have an organization called Your Anti-Racist Neighbors, which is led by our white allies um, who are teaching our white neighbors about anti-racism. And what's been phenomenal about this is that it's really called people in to the behaviors and the challenges of, uh, of people of color, uh, women of color, of our black community members. And that's been really beautiful. And I really wanna make sure we start promoting that, that something uh, allies like that should be everywhere throughout this district, um, we need them. And again, this, this, this question is, it's, it's so big and there's so many different layers to it, but the three biggest places in which I see need the largest change is in our schools. And that's through anti-racist curricula and instruction as well as professional development. It's in our civic leadership and making sure that our communities feel empowered to start their own clubs and civic associations. It's also a presence and an increase in civic engagement within our communities of color. And then thirdly, it's making sure that we have allies in the space who are doing the work with their own, uh, with folks who they identify with to call them in to provide change here in our district and make it a, a more anti-racist space. Thank you so much, Candidate Singh. And I want to echo that that question was very robust, but also really touched on some really important points. So Thank you so much um, for posting that in the chat. That was an audience question. Um, before we end for the evening, I know that you covered a lot of different things just in that last answer, but wanna provide you with three minutes in case there's anything else you would like to close with before um, we conclude for the evening. Absolutely. So this might be one of the last debates or, or forums I, I, I will have considering that voting starts Saturday, October 23rd. Um, first, I wanna thank Chaya CDC and their partners for hosting this and for all of those really robust and important questions asked by folks who are watching at home. Thank you so much. I think that this race is incredibly historical for so many reasons. Number one, this is the last Republican district in Queens. And for the last 12 years, a lot of our communities and community members have been underfunded and under-resourced for too long. Two, we have a chance of electing another South Asian in City Hall. And that is really exciting because we are so lucky to have Shahana Hanif um, and Shekhar Krishnan. And this could be our chance for Indo-Caribbean and Punjabi representation as well. And thirdly, our district has changed. It has become such a beautiful place to live and one where we did the hard work of expanding the electorate in the primary. We knocked on doors of people who lived here, who live here, who are registered voters, who are Democrats, who've never really either voted or never felt engaged to vote. Um, and they now have this will and this reason to be seen um, and to be valued. And our campaign gave them that. That can continue with your vote. Um, it doesn't have to stop at the end of this election cycle. Civic engagement will continue. Language justice will be centered um, as a representative and so much more that we've been fighting and yearning for for such a long time. Um, I, it is really unfortunate to see, and if you are the victim of this, um, receiving smear campaigns from Stephen Ross's Common Sense PAC, which is Stephen Ross, as I said, is a billionaire who's invested $300,000 in sending you mailers every single day about why you shouldn't be voting for me. And what that I hope it tells you is that fear mongering and scaring people to vote against me is just not going to work here. It's not going to work because the other side, my opponent, my Republican opponent doesn't have a plan is a career politician has been running since 1996 and has kept an insurrectionist, Philip Grillo, in power as a district leader in Queens still to this day. What that tells you is that she is in the pockets of billionaires and luxury developers 
she doesn't care and value our for uh, value our expansion of the vote and our immigrant population um, and wants to do everything she can to actually limit the power of our vote through a voter ID system and also making sure that our green card holders and permanent residents don't get a chance to vote. We can't we cannot risk this person being in office because that would limit us for another 10 years. This is our chance for a revolutionary change. This is our chance to trust that when we value our people and how we value people in running a campaign is exactly how we'll value them once in office. I really hope to have your support um, through your vote or however way you can participate in this election. If you don't live in District 32, you can phone bank with us, you can door knock with us. Um, but it has been a true pleasure and honor to be the Democratic nominee for the 32nd City Council District. And I'm hoping to serve you as your representative come November 2nd. Thank you so much, Candidate Singh. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you this evening um, and really wanna share gratitude for dedicating time to answer all of these questions. Um, before we end for the evening, just wanna restate that again, this was a nonpartisan forum. All three candidates were invited to participate in this forum for candidates running specifically in City Council District 32 and only one confirmed, which is candidate Singh. Um, all candidates did receive the Zoom link and questions this morning and were invited to answer questions um, in written form if they were not able to attend or provide an alternate date for this event. Um, so just wanna really clearly state that because we wanna ensure that um, all of the folks attending this event and also New Yorkers in District 32 have access to all the information they need to make an informed decision at the ballot box. Um, as Candidate Singh mentioned, early voting begins this Saturday, which is really, really soon. Um, and election day is November 2nd. The polls will be open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. that day. Um, additionally, a lot of great resources were highlighted throughout the forum, um, such as what the website links to all the candidates that are running in this race, as well as a voter guide, um, which was provided in the chat. Um, I'll just read it out loud just in case you missed it, but it's www.apavoice.org slash 2021 vote ready. Um, and we'll put it in the chat again. Additionally, um, the Chaya website was placed in the chat and links to vote.nyc, um, which is where you can find your poll site. Additionally, there are a lot of resources that I know city agencies have created like the Campaign Finance Board and Democracy NYC. So you can look on their website, specifically voting.nyc if you have any other questions. In addition to um, the roles for leadership that will be on the ballot, as mentioned earlier in the evening, there will be five ballot proposals. So just wanna make another plug and ensure that folks are reading up on those ahead of time um, and also know where they can access more information. Um, again, I read those links out loud, but also um, placing them in the chat. Um, and before I end, um, you know, with just a little bit of more information of how um, on election day, again, the polls are open from six to nine, but if you have specific questions on your poll site, um, you can reach out to Anthony who works at Chaya. Um, his contact info is anthony at chayacdc.org, or you can go to vote voting.nyc or vote.nyc. Um, I think if you wanna get more information in addition to your poll site, I recommend voting.nyc and we can post that in the chat again. Um, so sorry, I feel like I just gave a lot of different resources, but again, just wanna ensure that everyone who's voting has the information they need to make an informed decision. Um, before ending for the evening, just wanna give a quick shout out of gratitude um, this event wouldn't have been possible without our host, Chaya CDC, who planned this event and forum in partnership with APA Voice, Min Kwan, Caribbean Equality Project, South Asian Council for Social Services, Arab American Family Support Center, and Common Cause. So before ending, I would be remiss if I did not give a quick shout out. These are great community-based organizations that are dedicated to serving New Yorkers and really grateful that they provided an opportunity to have this conversation. With that, I hope everyone has a great evening. Again, this event will be posted on Facebook um, to ensure if you missed it, you have access to it or can share it with um, folks in your network. 
And also really wanna thank the interpreters who helped ensure that this event was accessible. Thank you so much. And I hope you all have a great evening.